Ladies and gentlemen, may I direct your attention to something quite extraordinary. You are listening to Kayak Adventure Series. Kayak Adventure Series. This is where you choose your own adventure. You want to be offshore? You want to be shallow? You want to go up the creek? You want to have a kayak that is sophisticated? Or a kayak that is simple? You get to choose your own adventure. Oh, looky there. That's a micro bag. I hope you brought the family. This is going to be wild. Hey, this adventure is going to be amazing. All right, guys, we're live. We took a week off. And it seems like when we took the week off, I don't know, you guys you guys went and did something. Looks like you guys were busy. And you both <laughs> had an amazing Bassmaster Championship. Both of you did. And 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 one of you, uh, I don't know, apparently collecting those blue trophies. What, what's yeah, going man. on? I don't know what to say, man. I don't know what to say, Billy. I mean, it was... <laughs> I don't know. I literally just shrugged my shoulders. Like I don't, I don't even, I'm still a little bit speechless. Um, I mean, obviously it's not true. I'll be talking a lot today, but at least explaining the event, I can speak a lot about that, but a little bit speechless on the fact that my plan and strategy from the moment they announced it worked out, but it was just a good time being at the house with Jake and the boys, Jake, you had a good event, man. Uh, super proud of you. 164, of the best kayak anglers and, you know, it's probably your best finish in the championship, I guess. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I had an awesome day one and I was like really in a good spot going into day two, but day twos are hard. I mean, honestly, like that's what makes these tournaments so tough to win is putting together. It's not just five fish, it's 10 fish and over the course of two days and yeah. a lot can change in 24 hours. So this is true. This is true, man. Um, the Billy, I mean, hey, I'm not going to forget about you, man. We're out there, but let's see you catch this 18 and a half inch, you know, fish Ohio smally in the 30 degree water whatever it was 38 uh that's pretty impressive too man so you had a good looks like yeah. you had some good stuff happen too while we were gone yeah it was it was freezing i uh, went out with Tarek walker uh we had to drag the boats up the creek looking for some smallies um we had okay. the old uh the ohio creek cold water running in our muck boots we both had water we had our dry suits on so we were safe but uh but you guys man ba back to jake like you know, talking about having a good day one, 85 and three quarter on day one, mm -hmm. Jake. Wow. Like, it, I mean, you were right there. Right and, um, and, and from what I hear from every, not just you guys, but what I heard from others as well, um, it was really, it was kind of crowded. Like the lake <laughs> wasn't the biggest lake and it was crowded. Yeah. Was, is that fair? Absolutely. Not, yeah. not for Drew, not for Drew. Yeah, but, not for uh, me. Hang he on, never dude. actually saw the lake. Fun fact. He, um, <laughs> He was off doing Drew things, but I mean, the main lake and it, which probably plays really smartly into what Drew did, honestly, the main lake was just packed. I mean, it was like you found your spot and then you just kind of had to kind of had to hold it because there wasn't really a lot of like wiggle room. Um, fortunately for us, there wasn't a lot of bass boats day two. And that helped because on day one, there was a lot of bass boats, but like kayaking space was at a premium. I mean, you basically had guys fishing 40 feet from each other. Um, in some spots you usually typically, I, every ramp I launched at from practice to, you know, the, through the tournament. So like six days of fishing, at least 20 people at them. So, yeah. It was nuts, man. It's such a fun event. I can't wait to get into it with you guys. Before we do, we might want to do uh, just a few few little news and notes here, I guess, right, about the uh, KAS. Um, I don't have a ton, really, uh, other than if I can share my screen, I will share the website so you guys can see something. Let's see here. Yeah. So – couple cool things uh, on the website we actually have a little timer countdown going now which is pretty cool uh like you can that. see we're we're 36 days away from sholy palooza so event number one there so that's pretty crazy um and then i believe yeah four ang if you go under four anglers you can see now event payouts are up there so there's our event payouts you can click on it there and see exactly what it is. And like I said last time when we talked about it, if we have 200 people at the individual division 
you know, $150 an angler, we've got it structured where the winner is going to get seven grand. So it's still going to be quite the impressive payout. Um, and I think we can hit 200. So I'm excited guys. Uh, actually, hold on. It didn't pop up for you guys. Did it? So sorry. Yeah, it, did. Not, it did. The payouts did. Oh, no, oh the no. payouts didn't. No, no, no. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. The, uh, the payouts did not. For some reason it went to a different screen. Hang on. Hang on. It, it opened another tab. I'm going to get Eric to fix that for us guys. It opened another tab. So I'll fix it. You can see what it looks like. Um, right here. There we go. There we go. I thought you guys were seeing this the whole time. I don't know if you guys can see oh, that there, but that's the event payouts. You can see seven grand and even, even 150 people still six grand. So it's not, it's not a nothing. That's for sure. And you'll notice guys, we've talked about it before. We pay out the top 15%. So look at those. You can go on the website and check this out. Go to four anglers event payouts. We're paying out down to 15% because that feels more in the spirit of kayak adventure series, right? To pay out further down. Excuse me, and if we actually, you'll notice a lot of the, the last 5% that pretty much just get your money back, but you get your money back, you get to walk across the stage, you, you get, you know, your, your award. So there's a lot of cool stuff uh, going on there. And I think that's, I mean, Jake, tell me if you uh, agree on this. I mean, a lot of it, a lot of folks, especially at this Bassmaster event, you know, or any event really, you just want to be on the stage. You just want to be acknowledged on the stage uh it doesn't matter if you're 10th or first you, you really don't care you just that's your goal you know let's cash a check let's just get on the stage so being able to give that opportunity uh for anglers down you know another five percent down to the top 15 percent even though it's not a ton of money it just kind of recovers your entry fee some of your gas money whatever get you on the stage where you're going to get your a nice awesome photo on that stage, we might let you we might walk across, let you say one sentence or something, one word. You, everyone gets one word. Maybe and the next person has to say it all makes a sentence or something. I don't know. But you get on stage, you get your award and you get your moment up there, which, again, for you guys who are trying to, you know, develop this and get you know sponsors and stuff that might, of course, help having a little bit of coverage up there on stage, a little media coverage. So we thought that was kind of cool. So um Let's see. Uh, man, these comments are coming. <laughs> There's so many comments. Uh, Merlin, I see Merlin's comment. It's true. We're going to get into this. We'll have to bring his comment up for sure. But um, other thing I wanted to mention is, okay, everyone, please be on the lookout for this. Okay. We are going to have signups uh, individually from the ACA instructors, the American Canoe Association instructors, who will be holding classes at all the Kayak Adventure Series events. But it's very important you sign up for the Sholey Palooza's instructionals on Sunday, the ones that are after the event by Jeff Little. I think Russ Snyder's is one to do one, uh, hold a class for you guys. Jeff Little, Dustin Hoy, uh, Dustin's in the comments right now because he made that, that comment earlier. So I think he's wanting to do it. And so basically guys, it's a five to one teacher ratio. Five to one is all that's allowed. Uh, you know, cause again, this is all set by the American Canoe Association. They don't mess around. They understand teaching and how students absorb information get information in it. They've limited it to five to one, but we have a place with a private lake that's stocked and has big bass in it. So you're going to get to learn your kayak and paddling safety and paddling skills and all that great stuff. And catch that, bigs. Yeah. And safety and catch bigs and learn <laughs> some fishing stuff as well from these guys that really know how to catch them. So, I mean, Sign I might up. end up doing that, honestly, because like I've, I know I've talked to Drew about this. I think a lot of people get into kayak fishing and they don't really like think about the safety aspect. Um, and it's something that was really fresh on my mind from this last tournament because practice was brutal on the lake. And I'm just thinking, like, what if I flip? What do I do? You know, it's like mm -hmm. it was really yeah. windy. And like that safety aspect is I think it's often gets overlooked by anglers because they, they're in these like really stable kayaks, but it anybody does, can man. flip. In Someone any flipped kayak. the blue sky. <laughs> we yep. heard, we I saw it. Flip. It did a 180. He <laughs> fell out. It came back over on the next wave and then he, he got back in. So I mean, it seems impossible you know, that it, that just happened, but it happened. I, I was, I was like shocked. Like he didn't even like react. He was just like, I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. I'm like, all right. <laughs> yeah. So, and, and it was crazy guys. It's not, we've talked about that. It's not just even the safety. I don't win this tournament. If I don't understand exactly. the way current works and, and water and rivers and understand how to be a better. And I've always learned how to be a better paddler because the fish utilize the same currents and current seams and current breaks 
that we need when we're going upstream or ferrying across. So learning, learning that stuff, and we'll get into how it helped me later when we really, you know, dive into it. But the ACA classes. So if, if you three teach one, I'm not sure I'm going to teach one. I might, I'm not sure yet because this is the first event. I've got a lot on my plate. I'm going to be super stressed and anxious about the whole thing. And uh, what we might have Steve Owens on next week to talk about the Bassmaster kayak series and how it, how it is running such a, an event on the scale that he did with Bassmaster on that giant stage there in Tulsa. Uh, we'll get his insight on that a little job. bit, but that's, that's how I'm going to feel a little bit. Um, yeah, he did an incredible job. I mean, Steve just knocked it out of the park. So the Bassmaster, very impressed. Um, and it was cool because we got a little bit of a feel for the KAS a little bit. Uh, because I was able to share my big fish, um, the big bass of the event clip, like a little edit I did, a little minute edit, and they put it on the big screen behind me. I wasn't sure they were going to do it, and I was busy just filibustering, talking, so I didn't even notice it was behind me. I'll tell you what, people uh, in the stands, when that clip played, when well, I won't spoil it, but when a certain part of that clip happens, there was like an audible, like, oh, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah. Well, well, I don't want to spoil it. But, no, it, and it's cool that that happened. We got to see a little bit about what the, the KAS is going to be all about in those theaters. and Because can you imagine if we had the whole top 10 up there had one clip of their biggest fish catch or their coolest fish catch and when they're on stage, and it's going to lighten the mood for a lot of you guys that are on stage. I know some people haven't been on a stage like that. There's a lot of lights in your face. It's not easy to talk in front of a lot of people. You only have a it's limited a, amount of time. To, very short amount of time. Yeah. So the, the yeah. clips being behind you is going to – ease that and make it keep it very light because we're going to be able to watch and laugh and talk to you about it you know supernatural like oh what happened you know what did you do here jake like what did you do to get that fish over those cables you know what, what, what were you thinking it just kind of lightens it up so that's the whole premise of this kayak adventure series presented by gopros just get those videos up and i'm excited to see it man I'm, I, it's man i don't know but anyway as far as kas yeah. news and notes that's well, about, and that's, that's a real yeah. that's a real example that you gave drew so if you guys don't uh, follow Jake on on any of the social media, go check it out because he posted the video. He really did catch a fish and then have to net the fish. It was the line was over Under. a cable. We're gonna show it. The, yeah, I'll show even it. show it. We're gonna show yeah, it. I've got two clips and they're both equally as like, what are you doing? Like, yeah, yeah. yeah. But I've I mean, some, you gotta do what videos. you gotta do, man. This is gonna be a very video filled, photo filled podcast here for sure I, i'm still working by the way i appreciate everyone all the the congrats and the thanks and the support the prayers all that stuff man thank you tyler um it means a lot to me it's a lot it's overwhelming um i riz what's up nick rizzo there thank you so much man it's overwhelming guys to have all this happen i'm still getting back to texts and messages and and it's it's hard in our society i've got you know you got all these social media things you got i was complaining to the guys about what i don't understand instagram there's a there's a request. There's a general. There's a primary. I have to like. There's a Facebook page. Oh, you have to do now athlete page. There's people that message there. Then there's my personal Facebook. There's text. It's like there's comments. I don't. I can't keep up with it all. But Drew I want to so say overwhelmed on, on the way back yeah. from from the thing. He's like, can you help me get through some of these messages? I was like, all right, I'll read them to you. Yeah, <laughs> that was really cool. Thanks for doing that. And it's it's a good problem to have. I am not complaining at all. But it will also. But I'm also being honest about anxiety and things that are real in life that that it did cause um from all just how overwhelmed it was or overwhelming it was so but i want to say now that i'm live on this and every podcast thank you guys i'm sure i've missed some people or something out there but um i want to say uh definitely billy while you're on before i forget thank you to you and uh to uh parker ryan parker who helped me lo loan me a battery so i did use a lot of torpedo batteries and, and wanted to make sure i had enough because uh that this has been my plan for a long time. So uh, Dustin Hoy, let me borrow one. Uh, Jonathan over at Eco Fishing Shop. I mean, I, I just wanted to make sure I had plenty because, again, they're only like 29. He was like Thanos collecting the Infinity yeah. Stones with those things. <laughs> he had one from Missouri, one from you know Ohio, one from <laughs> Indiana. I still got to get him back. Um, Zach Van Landingham here in uh, Northeast Ohio. Shout out to the Canio guys. And uh, he let me borrow one. And he let me borrow the Torquedo motor that I sold them just like a month ago because <laughs> I thought our tor team Torquedo, we were getting the new motor sooner in time for this event. We weren't. And I wanted to have a backup because Jeff Little always stressed like it's important to have your backup because if things happen, which it did in the tournament and I had to use that motor, there's a lot of things, but we'll, um, we'll, we'll stop there and then we'll just get started from a chronological order whenever, um, 
uh, unless you guys think of any other KAS updates, other than just to say, guys, join the Discord group. Someone yeah. put the link. Someone go find the link to Discord and put it in these comments. I got you. That's going to be a way to communicate. If you need lodging at these events, you need a, someone to stay with you. You have questions about things, campgrounds. You've got questions about the water, the river. Like they all have. The Discord channel has, um, you know, a, a separate channel for each event. Sholy Palooza, Ozarkana, you know, Wild Whitehall, whatever. They all have their own thing, and and it's a great community. It's a great way to get, you know, information, help each other out on that Discord, and it's much better and easier to use than Facebook groups just for organizing, right? So there it is right there. Thank you guys. Join that. It's going to be a lot of fun. The guys at Dark Horse Tackles uh, are awesome. Josh and Zach and Zach's been helping with that a little bit. And we're just going to get talking in there. Once you start talking and it starts growing, it'll become second nature and that thing will blow up. And we won't need to worry about these Facebook groups that as the world has evolved and not everyone uses Facebook anymore. It's just like it's a great place to meet people, too, especially like is. if you're going to the event, you don't know anyone going like you can meet other people. They're going to be there, collaborate, mm -hmm. collaborate with content, you know, all sorts of things you can do. Discord is is the future. I think we'll see a lot more of these trails moving towards that. Oh, you will. And you don't understand how it's better until you actually get in there and start using it. You just don't really understand and get it there's a voice channel in there we could people can go and talk about stuff you know in certain nights we could make a, a night where people just get on and, and talk but we'll, we'll grow it uh, discord's um something definitely to follow up um to follow up on and also again aca when we post about it how to sign up sign up right away so we can submit your names to the to the aca and actually uh get insurance and everything because they cover the insurance for those classes but um, it's important you guys sign up early, but it's going to be limited to 15 people, it sounds like, unless I do one at the very last minute. But that's hard to do. So, um, yeah, I think that's about it. Um, uh, yeah, that's about it, guys, for now. We'll have a lot more. So, yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the main event. GoPro highlight. All right, so the main event is going to be, uh, before you guys get into everything you're going to, get into have you been on any other podcast through or talked about this i was on serious angler last night and talked about it and then i have done other interviews and stuff like bassmaster's got some great coverage uh if you go to their website too but i've done some other interviews that aren't in podcasts uh eco fishing shops hooked podcast i was on i don't know when that goes out publicly maybe today uh they told me Friday, tomorrow tomorrow yeah okay hold on but but kayak adventure series is definitely one of the first so and first, i'm sure yeah. your phone is probably blown up with requests oh. to interview everywhere i've got a lot so. today there's no <laughs> doubt today is a very busy one so i'll be on kayak fishing weekly justin and i yeah. will knock that out i'll be on with uh armando and in, in the and maybe daniel perry if he joins on that one i'm not sure if he'll be on there with armando uh again i'm gonna be on i'm sure one of the paddle and fins or um i want to name them all but i can't remember them all guys so <laughs> sorry yeah. but uh joe rogan good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I'm, I'm going to kind of fade it. I'm going to fade into the background here. I'm going I'm to yep. let Go you ahead. guys tell your stories. I can't wait. Um, you know, honored to be on here. I'm so excited to hear all the details and then see some videos. So uh, take it away. Who, who wants to go first? I feel like Drew right. should go first, right? Thank <laughs> Mine's going to be lengthy. So, um, yeah, I can go first if you want. I mean, we'll, we'll chime in with your stuff and – you know, whenever you I want mean, we, to. So. We, you know, what's interesting is, though, is like we fish polar opposites. Like I would much rather have been doing what Drew did. It's just like the reality was is like you can't have 15 people doing that. Right. Yeah. So like I fished well, the main like Drew fished, you know, up up north and in, in the river. And um, it was just a much yeah. different experience. I think like we were doing much different things. Just the way we approached it was it was just like a, a 180 from each other. And I think that's interesting. So. Yeah, I'm going to uh, share my screen, Billy, like you're saying. I'll let you, and that way you guys have a lot of visuals to go along with. A lot no, a lot of this, these pictures and videos haven't been seen yet. So um, let me just share the entire screen. I'll close out of some tabs and stuff. You don't need to see my student loan debts and all that stuff that I got open on these other tabs here. <laughs> um, but I'll share the entire screen so you guys can see. Um, here we go. Just share it it's gonna be like inception for a minute here but i'll pull up the pre-fishing pictures here first how about that and we'll walk through so basically my strategy guys was 
Oh, man. You guys can see this? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sounds yeah. like you can see it. <laughs> so I can't see I you mean, guys. I was just I've... looking at her belly, and I'm like, man, look at that belly on the thing. Yeah, so this is pre-fishing, and my strategy from the very beginning was going up that river, and that's all I had because that lake is a, a – It's there's not like you can – hide in a bunch of cypress trees like the swamp on Santee Cooper or Caddo or anywhere like that on the lake. You can't get up any other, there's no other rivers and creeks you can get up that have any enough water to hold fish. You can't do anything other than like to get away other than this, this river. Well, you can so hide behind the docks as we'll see you later. Can't, yeah, <laughs> you can't hide behind the docks like you did. That's right. So my strategy was to go up the river and uh, I did that on Saturday, the first day of practice for me. Um, and then can't remember what was the first official day we could be on the water. It's probably like Friday. Friday, I believe. I think. So, yeah, so, I finally yeah. got there on. Um, yeah, I got there. Whatever was it? I don't know. This is we got Saturday. there Saturday. Okay. Um, Saturday. We left okay. at like around seven, I think. So you probably got there like late morning. That's right. Yeah. So I got in the water and I caught some uh, some nice fish in the river. As you can see, this is about a, a twenty and a half inch large mouth. I was just slinging a spinnerbait around. The weather was really warm and nice. You can see I'm in a short sleeve shirt. The water temperature had gotten up to like almost sixty around 60 so i caught catch a 20 and a half uh this is a night this is practice also a 19 and uh, uh i believe that was a, a 19 and a half i said on my video but what's crazy is on the tournament day i catch a fish at the exact same spot i threw a jig to be different instead of the spinnerbait because the water temperature definitely cooled down but it was 19 and three quarters in the tournament and i bet you that could have been the same fish because on my video i did say this might be the same fish is what i said about to myself but um I the water tail, definitely I'm, did drop for sure like yeah. five degrees it's it was crazy um and some of these aren't edited i thought i had this these edited better but where i brightened them up but you guys got get the idea i may have opened the wrong folder but there's some nice you know nice fish here all caught pre-fishing i like this is the little pile this um beaver little pile here was a real good spot that's a slough back up in the in the river there so that's that same fish but anyway there we go there's uh there's some pre-fishing pictures and um i will stop sharing the screen so i can just talk talk again that, and i can see you guys but so pre-fishing that was um first day i went and found those fish up the river and i went uh up the river about two uh, two two and a half miles i wanted to get further up than i think most people were going to fish pre-fishing pre I figured those fish were going to get all beat up, you know, from two miles from the ramp, you know, two, two and a half. So I just went further before I really started dissecting and really fishing hard. Because even the fish down below, I figured it just wouldn't matter. So I will share with you a, a video file. So what I did, once I caught those fish in practice, I went to uh, the lake and I dialed up, dialed in my torpedo setup to go faster because I realized, see, there I am now dialing in my setup on the lake. Uh, Rare footage of Drew on the lake, by the way. Yes. <laughs> so I'm leaning forward. I'm hitting 6.7 miles an hour with that. So I was able to get to go faster, and that was critical because, it, you know, like I talked about on the stage, I was uh, very much like a NASCAR, you know, uh, crew, pit crew, whatever, just, just getting it trimmed properly. And, and it's like a jack plate on a boat. You know, I wanted to get it trimmed up where I could – it could chew the full amount of water and not cavitate but still run as shallow as possible because that river has a lot of steep gradients. You know, they're real steep. They're not like rapids with big boulders. They're just these tight, narrow areas. And yeah, they're they'll like get choke real points. Choke point. And they also get real yeah. shallow, real shallow. Yep. And the water levels kept falling all event, which was freaking me out that I wasn't going to be able to get up there per the rules, you know. And um, so you got to stay floating. So fortunately, it, it held out just enough. But I can't imagine what that place looks like in, in the summer when it gets low. Um, well, I can they tell were you. having it gets mm -hmm. really low in the summer <laughs> mm -hmm. that was it was well below the median so you know for that time of the year too so basically i needed to put that torpedo in full speed at the proper settings with the proper setup i had that innovative sportsman rock guard if i don't have that i don't win uh if i don't you know their steering triangle from innovative sportsman the, the grass cutting blade which didn't really you know come into play for this fishery there was no grass but full speed going up some of those currents and sometimes you're barely moving like half a mile an hour or less getting up and paddling at the same time as hard as you can along with the full speed motor and if i don't understand currents i don't understand 
you know, whitewater paddling and, and, and just reading currents on where to ferry and when to cut across or where the slower water is on the surface that I can get up. I don't get, I don't get up that stuff. I mean, I just don't, I, I mean, it's very critical. So it all came into play. It's really cool that you can kind of credit paddling and whitewater kayaking skills and a motor and your fishing, you know, skills all into one, you know, event. So, but, um, from the very beginning, for sure, that was my, um, uh, strategy to just go up that river and getting it from 6.2 which is what i used to get on the trolley 6.2 but now that i've got it trimmed and adjusted which i'll do a walkthrough of the kayak and and teach some folks what i did to get it um to get draft a little shallower and and you know they're very shallow basically i can go in full speed in about i'd say like seven inches of water i could go yep. full speed uh which is hard to do unless you have it adjusted properly and again big shout out to jeff little you can go watch all the stuff on the little stuff channel He'll kind of he teaches a lot about that stuff um but but anyway it was just a cool cool um strategy and event and it worked and it, and it was just my strategy from the very beginning so once they once they announced 10 killer because i've known about that lake and and river because they put the tennessee river strain smallmouth in there when there was a fish kill i don't know back in the 80s or 90s they also dumped in i believe florida strain largemouth uh which i was that's one thing that surprised me is how big the largemouth were up that river too, not just smallmouth, largemouth. So and the uh, spot, because and the spots, big. I caught big an eighteen-inch spot. spot, which is like crazy. I mean, it's a Kentucky, mm -hmm. and I, <laughs> there were wow. some big spots for sure. I saw some in the water that were that were eighteen, nineteen inches. They didn't catch any that big. Oh, that, that's um, huge for Kentucky. Like that's a big. It's a big, a big spot. Kentucky, <laughs> big spot. Yeah. And the, you know, actually, on the the first day of the event, when I got up to my as far as I went up that river. I was sight fishing three spots. One of them was like 14 inches. The other two were like 17, 18. And of course I'm sitting there shaking that like TRD crawl down there. I'm like, come on, come on. This stupid 14 incher grabs it and just, and I, and I don't set the hook. I'm like, let it go, let it go. And eventually, or no, it was a gobius. I was using the gobius and he just swallowed it. I sat there forever with my finger trying to get him out. There's no way that fish made it. I felt horrible, but I was like, spit it out, spit it out. Let the other ones get it dang it so he spooked those other fish but i uh could upgrade a little bit more but um but that but so it's funny that the interesting part is and it's just crazy man when it all comes together like this i knew i was doing that i knew about that river it's been on a bucket list of mine to fish it for a long time because i knew it had really really good fishing in that lake and river both of all of it and so um uh, I just had planned on, on going up the river. And then when the funny part is, and a big shout out to Josh Strinko, who's an amazing smallmouth angler with a Shegan, uh, who's helping us with shirts for the kayak adventure series. So look out for some of their collaborative shirts um, and Smalley talk podcast, because when he won Susquehanna, we were staying at the Airbnb together. I was so happy for him because you know, he deserved it and he crushed it. But at the back of my mind, I was already, I was still thinking about 10 killer already. Like, dang it dude he's going to find and figure out when he does research what's in that river and he did he already knew i think he had some friends that, that you know have fished and floated that river you know he's very entrenched in the smallmouth river fishing circles okay uh, the guys over there are gonna know and uh you know didn't really say didn't really talk we talked one time about it and we that we you know he knew there was big ones up there and stuff and i said yeah yeah so i knew i was gonna probably have to face him as a competition but he chose not to come to the tournament you know he said it was a lot of expense and you know he didn't have the setup i had he just won that in i what is it, i11 so it is the inflatable and he the was hobie, in an eye track hobie eye track, track yeah no no motor drive. so i mean he probably you know couldn't he, he definitely couldn't have gotten up where where i got unless he would have got a motor set up and all that but i was calculating in my head all the great river anglers and people like you jake you love the river and john dalton who stayed with us and matt ball and jody queen and and russ snyder's so, everyone i knew i was knew gonna, like, hit that river christine i already just, knew what drew was doing like he didn't tell me like he didn't he was very coy about anybody. it but i knew what he was doing because he's like oh i didn't pre-fish i was like it's like there's no way i know where he's been going i could i could i could see the mud on the kayak i was like i know what he's doing and, and on i the had truck. The river. <laughs> yeah yeah on the tacoma i had I had fished the river and done pretty well, but the issue I had, and this will go back to what Drew was saying, nobody worked harder to get to those his fish in the tournament than Drew. I did what he's talking about, like trying to attain and going up the river. I got maybe two and a half, three miles up there before I was like, I can't do this anymore. It's just too taxing with this battery or with this motor. And it doesn't make a lot of sense for me to spend, you know, an hour just trying to go a quarter of a mile with my setup. So I ultimately decided not to fish the river, even though I had caught some pretty good fish in there. Um, it, 
if I would have known that the lower half was, you know, just nobody was going to fish it, because we can talk about that later, but our buddy John went in there and just fished right there by the ramp and absolutely crushed mm-hmm. it day two. He did. I might have yeah. actually fished around that's, there. Um, that's a funny part of the story. It really is. Yeah. I, like, we'll get to, we'll I had the river on my radar. I knew what that river had in there. I was telling people, like, yeah, there's a giant largemouth in there. Like, I already knew that. It's just... It was a hard, you had to work hard for that. You had to want it to go up that river. Like yeah. I'd say like 99.8% of people aren't doing that. You know, it's just, it, you're just not doing it. So. Yeah. They don't, no, you're right. Most people just weren't, but they also, I think a few things worked in my favor and one it's on a strategy. I went to that access area and I went a half mile d- through the dirt roads and the, and the mud pits and stuff up a half mile lunch, lunch <laughs> from the gravel, uh, the bar, the, whatever the gravel kind of bank from that public access area and pre-fishing on the first day caught those fish uh got out of there and never was seen there again and it, it sounds silly but it but you got to think about it. i mean no no elite angler wants to be seen on their juice and practice from to the other, other anglers you know what i mean it's like it's it's it may not have mattered one bit you know what i mean people probably knew i was going up the river i think already that's if anyone everyone had to guess you know if they didn't see me of course they probably were guessing that's what i was going to do so i don't know how much it mattered but i didn't want to be seen there i left and then from there from that point forward uh because i went up probably like three and a half miles that first day and then um i uh ended up the next days went and launched further up up the river you know places that weren't obviously our our designated launch for the event just to float down to where i'd gotten up three and a half miles you know to that point where i can meet meet up and then turn around and go up and make sure I can make it up further, you know? So I kept going. I went as far as I think 13 or 14 miles up from our designated launch just to see how far I can get. Not, not thinking I was going to actually go that far. And I didn't obviously need to go that far in the tournament, but just to see how far I could get and see where I could find fish, knowing that I probably had a setup that other people, you know, with that Crescent kayak Sholey, that's the thing. If you don't have a Crescent kayak Sholey or both that's similar that can draft that shallow and, you know, with that Torquedo, it doesn't, and be able to, you know, work in the current the way that that boat does. You just don't make it. So I knew that not many people had that, especially given, you know, the technology and live scope and the, the style of boats that a lot of other anglers are, are fishing with. But what's cool, guys, dude, the bass lives deep, shallow, lives everywhere. So it's cool that we all have our own personalities and style. And I can take mine and do what I want to do to catch bass. And you can do take your personality and what you love to do and, and catch bass. And obviously, I mean, the lake showed out. I mean, they got they caught them. I didn't. I didn't blow this thing out of the water. It's just a couple inches, you know, and, and it was a tie for a second. So one more fish by any of those guys, you know, and, and I'm not sitting here. And so it was a log jam from like. It was. Lake fish 15th good. down to like where I was. Like literally I catch one more fish and it's like, oh, suddenly you're on you're, the stage. Like it's like, stage. it's crazy. Like it was a competitive yeah. tournament and the lake was packed. <laughs> it really was, man. Um, it's, But I did go that far up just so I could see where, where I could get. And then um, had to manage the torpedo battery, you know, with the throttle, because if you go full speed, then it's going to use more juice. And I only had so many, you know, I could bring and, it, you know, it, it, to weight them in the front, put as much as you can on the front. I had three up front um, in the hat, two in the hatch and one in the little cubby. That So just so you know, guys, on the Crescent Sholey, and I'll admit this, this wasn't like the, the design. The the lower hatch portion, the deeper one, was made for sure to fit a torpedo battery. We're making sure it was big enough for that. It fits lots of batteries, but you can put your X2 batteries in there, put your t- torpedo, whatever you want. They fit in there. But the next cubby ab- above that upper section, you have you have to kind of squeeze it in there and shove it a little bit. The, the plastic flexes a teeny bit, but you can get another torpedo battery up there on the upper level, and the lid, the, the hatch lid will close securely without being like popped up high and actually two of them will fit in there and then another cool thing is <laughs> that the torpedo battery fits in that cubby you do it upside down and it fits in that front cubby for the sholey as well so that's three right there i was able to have um again they're only 29 amp or whatever it is 30 amps so you got to bring several because it's not like you can just throw a couple uh, it's a proprietary battery you can't just throw a couple like on your newport i know you can use Whatever you could just carry two hundred amp hours and probably had the same amount of power I had, you know. Well, I run a fifty, and that's probably good enough to go all day, even in that scenario. So because yeah. it's twenty four volt, so right. So I got all the way way up there, and part of why I was up there is I wanted to obviously complete and see how far I could get and be stay legal, and I was able to get all the way thirteen miles. So I knew that was never going to be an issue, uh, assuming the water didn't fall too much faster. 
And then the other cool thing from a strategy perspective was I wanted to fish way up there. So I wasn't beating up any of my fish and just learn how to catch fish in that river. So I'm out of bounds. And I've talked about this in other podcasts from a strategy perspective. And yeah, you got to have a lot of experience, a lot of, uh, you know, balls for like a better word to try to go catch fish that are not even in your, you know, reach, right. They're out of bounds, you know, but it helps help me learn how to catch them and uh, figure it out you know, for tournament day. So, well, that's important on a river because when you're river fishing, like patterns typically go yeah, all the way up the river. And I'm not saying that you won't catch a, a small mouth off a sandbar, but like if you're catching small mouth on wood, yep. 15 miles upstream, there's a good chance that small mouth at your spot are going to be on wood or large yeah. mouth or what, you know, whatever. So that's true. They changed for sure. And it, and it was, I mean, this term, it was wild, man. They, they changed on me and I just was fortunate to get them, but I'll show, um, show some other videos here so day one um so here we go day one and we'll find oh those are all my pictures all right here's my video so day one i went up and caught let's see what i want to show you guys first here this is the small mouth that caught at the end of the day i started with a 19 um in a in, in a half inch or whatever in that slough Actually, I'll show. Is this. it the first slew there? I'll show big bass. I'll just show the big bass. And the reason I'm showing this one, let me pause it. I'll set up the scene here. The river's to my right. The water's coming in, but this is a slew going back straight ahead of me. And that slew's got beavers in it. They kind of murk it up. So halfway back, or you're just even a quarter way back into it, it gets very muddy. So I had setups for your Oklahoma spinner baits with painted blades, double skirts. I put two skirts on it so there's more of a water displacement around the bait so they can feel a little bit better. And I put that Z-Man uh, minnows trailer on there. Uh, this is a chartreuse and white spinner bait. So I got like a pearl chartreuse tail on the spinner bait and I fished it in the muddy water. And then in the, in the water that's for me to where you can see right here, it's like two foot of visibility. And then to my right where the water's coming in, it's like 10 foot of visibility. So it, you can see you got to be prepared for multiple water clarity situations. So, um, and, and this is on day two. It's the first fish of day two, but I want to show it because it shows the slew here. And uh, this is the big bass of the event right here oh, on day two. But see the slew, how it goes back there? Oh, my God. And the beavers oh, keep it muddy back there because they move around a lot. It's the only fish I caught on a chatterbait. No net needed. Yes! There's a yes! lamprey that fell off it. Oh, my old faithful Project Z chatterbait. Look at the size of this thing, dude. Oh, that is a gift from God. You can save about a six inches. and a half pounder. I would oh, say that's a great it's way to start a tournament. Good morning on wow. final day. Bassmaster Kayak It's a $500 fish. Yeah, it, it turned out to be a $500 fish. Absolutely ready to spawn. So you can see that's the river air to the right coming in, cutting through a cut, um, the main clear work river. So. But backing up, that was uh, so just so you guys can get a visual of that slew. Oh, I would start there and I caught five fish on day one in that slew. They were all 16 inches and up, 19 and three quarters, 17 and three quarters. I'm going to go back and look and see if that fish during practice was the same fish because in practice it was 19 and a half. And I bet you I didn't really like try to well, see. Well, that one had a it. scar on its but, left gill plate. So that might be a good yeah, way to compare. Uh, uh, yeah, it's true. I can go back Unless and it's from you the first time. <laughs> yep. It could, it could have been. Um, but then I went up, so I left that slew with five fish for 80, mid, mid 80s or high 80s or whatever it was and went upstream. And that's when it gets tough because you got the clear water smallmouth. And so here is where I caught a upstream, I went way upstream. Now, before I get up this far, guys, later in the day, it's blue. This is, you know, day one was bluebird skies clear, difficult. Before I get way up here, I just want to say my torpedo gave me an error code in the middle of the day and it wouldn't work for about 20, 30 minutes. I was just stuck but i already had you know the, the mid 80s or high 80s whatever i had a pretty decent you know you know bag but still want obviously wanted to catch more fish and get further up to where i found these fish here and practice on this bank that was you know holding a lot of good smallmouth so and then somehow man i just was like praying and you know saying prayers and magically i'm telling you it's god for sure like it, it started working and never it never stopped working again the rest of the day out of the blue so you know, and I had to stop and, you know, readjust that rock guard, you know, tighten it because it gets, it shakes loose a lot during the day. You just got to keep, keep checking your equipment. You know, you got to.
know how to do that and keep your tools. You know, Jeff Little always preaches, keep those tools, everything that you need for the torpedo. Keep an extra, keep all of it on your kayak. And I'm, I'm fortunate I did all that. So this was on the, the bank. You can see where there's not actually a lot of calm holes like this when the water gets up. And in the winter, they want to be in these kind of calmer pools like this. The water temperature was real cold, by the way, on Sunday and Monday. We had cold nights. It was oh, it was conditions. And that's when most people fished the river, which was hard for me because they were, our Airbnb was five minutes from the launch on the river. And having to watch all the people pass our house, fishing that river, all the good anglers, uh, man, it was tough. I was one of them. I went up the you river up, on Monday. <laughs> yeah, you guys you guys hammered it. It was, just, it was tough uh, up there those days. And I think that's why people, even Russ was like, man, that's probably what it was. It was just like the weather got made me think that it, they weren't in there that the way they were. And, um, and it, I think it was because I fished further upstream on those days on the river and it was a very tough bite. So you guys happen to be hitting it. The rest of the field hit it on a day. I think the days that were just the toughest to, to catch them. And that's what kind of turned people off because it was just Steve Baker and myself on day one at the utmost ramp. And Steve was able, he's got an awesome setup too, the torpedo and, and learned a lot. And he was able to get up. He was with me for a lot of the day. He's up about six, seven miles or whatever. He went up alongside me. He just didn't have enough battery power to keep going any further. But this one cre critical fish here, so think about it. When I leave that slough, there's not a lot of fishing happening. I'm working my way up getting to this spot. I mean, it's a lot of just, you know, I cast a little bit while moving, but they just weren't on moving baits and stuff, bluebird skies, post-front conditions. But I knew I'd found these fish here, and they were down deeper, just kind of sitting there. And, and I just, it was clear, so I thought, well, I need to pick up that Z-Man Gobius and a spinning rod, which I do not like, as you guys know, fishing with spinning rods, uh, unless I have to. I'm more of a power fisherman, like single hook, swim bait, buzz bait, chatter bait, spinner bait kind of guy, jig, anything I can boat flip and use 30 pounds straight braid. That's me. But so I will say that before I show you guys this video, you know, every elite series angler, you know, any pro angler, you'll look back sometimes and you're like, Oh God, that was like so bad that fish landing or my form or whatever. I want to teach you guys what not to do here. Cause I fought the fish fine. It's like a big open pool and there's plenty of depth and, and there's no logs and trees, but eventually the fish moves me down towards a log and I do keep my hand kind of right on my spool and I loosen up the drag a lot. Um, so I, they can just run, it can just run on that light wire, you know, hook and, and stuff, eight pound straight braid. And so I, I always will like, if it's starting to run somewhere, I don't want to go. I just put my hand over the spool and then pull back. So it can't, you know, it can't go any further, but, um, at one point it got close to this log and I do, I, I pull it and I just get it close. And then you, I, you, you know, you're supposed to bring the rod behind you and just, I always preach like, don't ever grab the line. Don't ever grab the line. And I just freaked out and panic when it got close to the, this big underwater log it was pulling towards. And I started just grabbing the line and I belly, belly her in again. I don't use nets and I should have used the net on, especially on my spinning rod fish. I should have. And, and he's got one, one right there. I've got one behind me. I should have like just grabbed it. I belly it in and just just watch the gobius from z-man falls out of its mouth when i finally just belly it right in the boat so very very fortunate uh this fish got in the boat here and i'm gonna fast forward to the fight see there's the hookup and i look back i'm like oh uh am i recording with my my, my gopro yeah i was like okay cool it's recording so i start loosening the drag right away because i do not want this thing to pull stop, stop. break line or pull the that light wire hook Stop. So stop, I will stop. You gotta, spare you guys the that, long. Where's that paddle going? Uh, that paddle stayed in, fortunately, this time. Uh, <laughs> I see where you're going. Oh, come on. All right, I'm getting close to where the point where, and I've got the front angle you can see. But you'll notice the goby is pop out of its mouth. See that to the right there, that little, where that little point comes out, that little small point. You'll see there's a log underneath yeah. the water. It's going to come into the picture in a second. Yeah, it's a I giant. See. One giant log under the water, no, 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 no. right there, underneath my kayak right now. I'm just trying to see, I barely got it up over it, no, 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 no. and then just start grabbing the line, freaking out. Did you sit bit. in the floor of your kayak? Yeah, I'm in the floor, down the floor of the kayak. I always do that when I belly them. Oh my the, god, the gobias! There goes the gobias. Yeah, oh yeah. See it pop yeah, out. Just right fell out. You, yeah, you can, you can, you can see it again here. Watch the gobias just pop right out. Oh my god, the gobias just fell out. Oh my God! Thank you, God. So I was pretty excited about that. Um, I, went I probably would have dropped that fish. The score and a half on the Gobius. Let's go, Bias. That's this kind of stupid dad joke. So <laughs> that was a dumb dad joke. <laughs> Let's go, Bias. You guys get the audio, right? 
Yep. Yep. This, okay. Everyone gets it. Then I just let the fish go and, uh, yep. And she goes. Let her go. So, see, girl. And, uh, that was cool, man. It was a cool, cool fight. I'll never forget that. The, um, let me remove that video and I'll show another one here. The front angles kind of. No, 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 I just, no, 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 no. I don't like that one's finger eyes. You just can't tell. Yeah, I'm down on the floor. I'm like, oh, no, 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 that's a 21. I can't believe right? this, dude, this is the 19 and a half. This is day one. Oh, okay. oh, day one. But, uh, so this fish called me up from like a 16 like and got me like three and a half inches. So it took me a long time to get up where it was, but um, Gobius, baby. it uh, ended up being a huge, huge part of the event. So again, my the fish I catch at the beginning actually aren't that far upstream. You know, really, people could have got to those. Well, I know exactly that bank. So that's why I was like, huh, you're not as far up as I thought you were. Well, right there, that's that's far up on that video. But the first slew was not. Oh, it wasn't those first. I got you. I got no, you. no, that was way, way up there. I mean, way. <laughs> like a, it like took me all day to go along to get there, basically without hardly even fishing much. But I knew that there was some good smallmouth up there, and I had a good bag already. So, anyway, then I go to um. Then then it was day two. I catch that I had 90, 90 inches sitting in fourth place. Guillermo obviously was in the lead. He, you know, he crushed it uh, on day one with like 92 and three quarters. And then I go um, on day two, I catch that big large mouth, right? To start the day. Um, and then I catch this giant smally, which is the other video I'll show here. Um, well, here it is. Let's bring it up. Before, if you ask me, I think this fish deserved to be big bass. Just Yeah, I know, right? It should have. <laughs> I'll set the stage just so you know, like this, I fished the slew again. The next day, I started with the large mouth slew, hoping to finish there with the limit so I can ease my, you know, calm myself down a little bit. I catch the 22, which certainly helped me calm down. It was a giant, you know, it took big bass. And I knew that was putting me in good position for a good limit. But then I catch another 16. Great, you know. However, I missed three. I lost three fish on the spinnerbait. You know, one of them just missed it, rolled and missed it. It was right near the boat in that muddy water. The next one I had on went under a log and it just somehow pulled off and I'm just hung on the log and I'm like, dang it. And then I missed another one. So three of them and nothing I caught in that slew was ever under 16 inches, nothing pre-fishing and tournament. So I know those fish are good fish. Right. And that's making me very nervous because now I'm going about to go out, out in that clear water and have long runs to any of the other fish. Uh, but I did see some big fish in some pools that I learned more, a little bit more about on day one. So I had that confidence that I, okay, I know they're up there, but I'm very nervous because it's hard to catch them in the clear water. I stopped in at Jimmy Houston's outdoors the day before, picked up um, this swim bait. It's the only fish I didn't catch on a Z-Man bait is the Zow Dangerous swim bait. Fast sinking because we were watching Tyler Berger's Bass Fishing HQ video where he we did. tested all the swim baits cool together. Video, that was, by the way. was a cool video. Um, so shout out to him. Um, and and it, so it starts working at like one mile an hour and it, it blows out at three. I was like, wow, that's a nice range. So I was like, I want that one. And uh, Russ has always talked about that bait, done really good on it. So uh, I was like, all right, let me grab that. And um, and I got a fast sinking. The only one they had at that store that was fast sinking was a trout pattern. And I was like, I don't care. And, you know, there's no trout in here, but I don't care. They'll eat it. You know what I mean? Like I always say this, like we all know what happens if you throw a goldfish in this river. You know what I mean? It's not going to sit there and not get eaten. It's going to get eaten. So trout pattern, yeah, who because cares? These fish see this. They're like, dude, we've been eating burgers all week. Give me a pizza. You know, it's like. <laughs> Give me some sushi. Yeah. So. Give me that I, clam uh, chowder. Yeah. So, so I did um, yeah, the clam chowder. That's right. That's what I, I chug Campbell's all day. Just chug it while I'm moving. But so then I caught two 14 half inch spotted bass on my way up to this point. So now I've got four fish, but they're two small spots to go along with that 22 and the 16, right? But I was on fishing some wood on the right side. I, I was getting the bites of those spotted bass. I said, maybe I should slow down a little bit more and, and keep doing this with the spinnerbait, throwing that sling blades from Z-Man. And then I threw it and caught, hooked a 19 half inch smallie. And it's fighting me for like 30 seconds. It jumps three times on the third jump way out of the water. It throws the spinnerbait and I, I miss it. 
and I'm just heartbroken because I know how hard bites are going to be to come by because I'm not fishing as much because I'm running a lot and working. Also, um, that would have been the classic stage. I know for a fact I'm on the stage if I catch that fish, right? Because that's a 19 and a half and I had the 22 already and 16. I had a decent. So I'm heartbroken, but at least I was taking the positive from it and saying like, you know what? God let that happen. He showed me that they're on wood. They were not on that stuff in practice and pre-fish. They totally changed between the, the, the first day of the tournament and even the second I day. I think that cold front pushed them in to stick to the cover because that water temper really yeah. dropped. Yep. I think so. And as it got lower, they were the, the cur- amount of current that was on this, especially from the first day of practice, the amount of current that you see on this wood right here to the right, there was a lot more. And they didn't want to be in that swift water because the temperature got down into the low 50s at one point. So they kind of went back to their deeper holes, kind of like your wintering holes at those times. But then as it warmed up, you know, the first day, the first day or the last day of practice, first day of the tournament were in the 70s. First day of the tournament was really warm. And then this day was 72 the second day, but it was cloudy. It's supposed to be, doesn't look that cloudy there, but it was cloudy and drizzly a little bit. And I saw that and I said to myself, I need to either pick a huge bait, go get a huge bait from that store, or I need to finesse them with that Gobius again. And so with the cloud and wind, I was going to try to get him to bite that big bait. So once I caught, lost that fish on the spinner bait, at least I learned something from it. I took the positive, wasn't happy I lost it. But it caused me to slow down and fish this wood that I would not have fished. 100% would not have fished this wood. I would have just blown past it because I never caught them on that in practice. And I saw how many were in the deep, some big pools further up that I was trying to get to around all the rock and sitting deeper. If I don't lose that fish, I don't catch this fish. So it actually won me the tournament. So just that just just stay positive, guys, and, and just keep true to your faith and trust that God's got a plan for your, your event. And that just happened to be mine. But I catch this fish and I hit the hit the uh, GoPro right here uh, as fast as I could once I hook it on the back because it wasn't running. And I wanted to make sure I capture everything. Um, so oh my God. it's huge. 21 and a quarter small, like pushing six. This jump right here is the one that I'll never forget. This next jump, you're about to see it. When it comes out of the water and you see the size of this. I do lose my paddle here, by the way. There it goes. So I didn't even Bye-bye. care. I wasn't even paying attention. Come on, girl. Watch this hey, jump. bending branches float. The, the best part. Of so you can see, yeah, they do float. How big that fish was. I mean, you got to see this jump again. When it just breaches, I'm like, oh my goodness. This is a freak wow. of nature. And it's on that big single hook. See, this is more my style. Just give me a big single hook, which is hooked good. I know I hit her really hard when she hit it. And so it's, the hook is penetrated in. In the boat. Yes. Oh my God. So, oops, I'll, uh, I'll present the front, the front camera now and you guys can see that. And then that'll be all the, the videos I'll probably show, but, um, this is what it looked like from the other side. But yeah, that was a, a fish that obviously, like you said, Jake, I, I mean, that almost deserved to be a big don't bass jump. given it was almost a six pounds. No, no, no. I mean, it was 21 and a quarter quarter right? yeah i mean that's wow it doesn't get much better than that you know when it comes to big rivers oh, freak me out with that bait going off the, the line you know, this but look at his oh, mouth my God. what just happened that's a yeah. small what? mouth and he had that whole thing in there happened. yeah oh my god so anyway uh that was a obviously and we had this oh, stage you can see i did, did a, a cool you can see kind of how big it is on the Oh, okay. I thought I had the release there. I don't have the release part. But I have to find it. Um, sorry, I'm trying to remove that from the stage here. But um, I will just show you the uh, some 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 of the pictures, I guess. I mean, I, I don't know what the comments are. Hopefully, you guys are enjoying this. I'm just kind of like, oh yeah, everyone's everyone's in. into this, man. Okay, I'm loving it. Cool. Um, these are my already edited versions. So this is, uh, so this will give you some, here we go. We'll grab all these. That's the big one that started the day, the 22. Uh, that's, that's me measuring the 21 and a quarter smally. Uh, that's in the middle of the fight when it's starting to breach by the boat. You can see a screenshot from that. Uh, and that's kind of when I was just, after I scored her, you know, on the kayak there, hopped out to get a, you know, a little deeper water and let her go. So 
It's a beautiful shot. There's the mouth. You can see how, how just big the, the bones are on the fish's mouth. That's when you know they're just freaks when the smallmouth looks like that. I mean, looks and like small a carp. Smallmouth have really bony mouths because they're more compact. So a lot of people, that's why they're such good escape artists. Like they'll just yeah. throw the hook. Like you got to get a good hook set on them. Yep. And so the Go fish ahead. came from that log. I paralleled the log. I threw it right at the root ball at the base of that log. And I was, uh, you know, just paralleled it. And on the about third crank, it just hammered it. I and mean, came out and a third cast with that bait too. So and that's the big large mouth at the beginning. Again, they're kind of out of order here. Uh, oh, that's it. Those are all those. But, um, yeah, that was, I'll never forget that one. The, um, I will show you the, the pictures, just a few from the day one here. Um, that I didn't, you didn't see a video for that. That's that 19. That's the one I think could have been the same one I caught on practice in that same spot right there behind me, mm -hmm. 19 and three quarters. So kind of long and skinnier. And that's that big smallie, the 19 and a half. Um, and that it, it might've been that same 19 and three quarters. So day one was a little bit more of the consistency kind of bag, you know, everything over 16 and a half or whatever it was. Day two, I left, unfortunately, let, did leave that. Um, I'll stop sharing the screen here. I did leave that uh, four, a 14 and a half spot still on the, the stringer, but obviously it didn't matter. I had 90 and a half, um, and I was, you know, lamenting losing those. I also had another big bite on that Zal Dangerous swim bait at a big pool further up, kind of like where I caught that 19 and a half inch. That's what I was trying to get to, where I caught that 19 and a half on the Gobius on day one, thinking they're going to, now that it's cloudy and windy, they're going to hammer this big swim bait kind of like that one just did so once i had caught that one i thought i was going to go upstream and catch another 20 and just start pushing you know mid 90s or upper 90 inches but uh i got hammered one time on it there was another guy fishing the locals were hammering this river every day they're up there smallmouth fishing not just cat fishing they 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 know a lot of those guys too were pounding the white bass um because the yeah, white bass were. were running sorry sand bass sand bass yeah <laughs> yeah but uh yeah that's kind of the how it all went down and just couldn't get rid of that small one, but it was just enough. And I was nervous, um, sleeping on that because I wasn't sure if Guillermo had upgraded a kind of, it sounded like he didn't kind of the, the doc talk, but it doesn't mean somebody else didn't, you know what I mean? Upgrade and, and, or even didn't submit any fish until after lines out. But I knew I had a, a, whatever it was, three and a half inch lead when the board went off and I uh, just was praying that it would hold out. And uh, fortunately it did, but it was a lot of fun with the guys giving me a hard time behind the stage. I was so nervous. Uh, you know, kind of asking everybody like, so how was the bite in the afternoon for you, man? Like, how was it going? And they're like, they were so messing with me. Um, you know, especially the guys from California there, they were having a good time. Um, and, uh, they were like, Oh, it was on fire. The afternoon bite was on fire, dude. I'm like, Oh, stop to, you know, and they were just kind of, you know, it may have been on fire, but they were, but they knew they didn't have enough. And, but it was a cool experience. Um, trying to think, um, who else? Uh, definitely do, do want to shout out to Guillermo. Uh, man, what a classy guy. You know, uh, you know, I said on my Instagram, you know, if there's no one I'd rather lose to or beat, because if you beat him, that means you've really done something. You know, he's such a good angler. And we lose to I him. Mean, he's he, a pure he's kayak like, angler. Like, if you watch absolutely. Guillermo fish, he is just, I'm not saying there's a right and wrong way, but Guillermo fishes like old school kayak angler. Like, he's standing, yeah. he's, you know, he's moving. He's doing things like if you look at his kayak, he's got rods mm -hmm. everywhere. And that's usually yep. a sign of like, and Drew and I talked about this, that controlled chaos. That's like, that's like part of kayak angling. If you're not like, you know, scooping your smallie into the boat and the thing falling out, are you really kayak, kayak angling? But yeah, <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I'm still just overwhelmed by everything, but uh, I, I just want to make sure I thank everybody. So I'm trying to think. Oh, well, one thing I wanted to say, it's on my list here. When you fish shallow, skinny water up backwaters, rivers, and creeks, one thing that's very critical, obviously we're headline sponsored by GoPro with the Kayak Adventure Series, is to record everything. That way you have receipts, man. you got proof about everything. You know, uh, I mean, I've got all my attainments up the river on video. I've got every fish catch on, on video. So, and it you know, obviously helped me in, in the past, too, when there was a protest to be able to say, no, 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 here's, here's how I did it. Let me show you guys. So... I think feel like we have an extra little bit of level of responsibility on us. Like even that previous tournament that was protested that I went on Pickwick, you know, I told the tournament director where tournament director, where I was fishing before the event pointed on the map. I shared my location with them on my, from my iPhone. So they knew uh, this tournament, Steve Owens, you know, 
like like we've talked about, did such an amazing job. He asked me uh, at the check-in. He said, "So, man, what do you think, man? How's your pre-fishing? Good, bad?" Like, I said, "Yeah, I think I think this." And I told him, I said, "You know, I'm, I'm going, you know, way up the river. Just you know, I'm going way up the river. I'm all in. Like all my chips are in." And uh, you know, he was like, "Good luck." So, and uh, so I feel like it's just a little bit more just level of responsibility on us to film yourself, cover your butt for sure with having all that stuff, learn all the laws everything like that about the waterway you're fishing and what you can and cannot do and stuff like that. I mean, I talked to everybody. I call, talked to game wardens there. I talked to everyone just making sure it was, is you just got to be double, double sure that everything you're doing is, is on the up and up. And obviously of course, follow all the, the Bassmaster rules as well. So uh, I did that and then, uh, but filming it will help you. And then um, another little quick note, and this is definitely critical and, and good for you guys fishing the KAS is, some of the USGS gauges will give you the um, CFS, the gauge height, and other parameters like water temps. And I found one way upstream, many, many gauges up that, from where I was fishing, and the water had a water temp gauge. So before the tournament, I'm able to already start learning what my water temp is and start planning my lures and my baits and my, the style, how I'm going to catch them, you know, how aggressive they're going to be. So um, that's another tip. And then... Oh, this is a cool thing I just want to say. I think it's pretty cool. Guys, we are not making three hundred, winning $300,000. This isn't the Bassmaster Classic, but kayak fishing is getting there. And, you know, KBF has given away $100,000 in the past. And, you know, huge, huge event, six, 700 people and 50 and 75. And the TOC from Hobie get, I don't know if it was 30 or 40. I mean, this one was 25500 I guess, with the big bass. But I just wanted to say this. This is pretty cool. That for a $400 entry fee and for all the entry fees, whatever I paid to, to qualify for that but four hundred dollar for this event entry fee if you take all the anglers at the bass master class bass boat anglers kayak anglers everybody guess where i stand on the on the money list for who walked away you know from that weekend you guys know probably not no well, i was i was fifth out of all the anglers at the classic and kayak so i was more just a little bit more than lee livesey who, who got fifth place and won twenty five thousand. so i would have been fifth place out of everybody there, boaters and kayak anglers. That's pretty cool that the winner of this event ends up being what you know way up there. And uh, of course, Bassmaster does a good job of covering it. The media, everyone. There's a lot more value than just that twenty five thousand. You know, we can go. I think they did a fantastic job covering it this go around. They like, really they, did. Like, and people cared. I mean, look at all the photos mm -hmm. that you took with the pros, and just like, I mean, you saw it a little yes. bit with Russ too when he won. You know, it's like the pros understand that it's not like easy to beat 200 other people to, to win this so but yeah it's true man the pros are starting to and what's cool is you know if someone like you know christine's won big 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 tournaments guillermo russ like a lot of the you know matt balls jody queens like you know you can just keep going on and on so and i hate doing that because i'm just like forgetting something but either way forgetting someone but um like but basically i feel like there's it's cool because we can use our platform and that a little bit of extra responsibility use our platform to push further into you know push a little bit with our whatever little bit of influence this gives us it's not a lot trust me it's like elite anglers always saying hey you get on the elites you think it's just going to come it doesn't it's hard you got to work hard and fight for it but what's cool is whatever we work hard and fight for and then basically that opens doors for future winners you know what i mean future people to and more for the the bigger bass world that doesn't follow us quite as much as we feel they should or yet we start kind of getting their attention a little bit more and so i feel like there's a, it's cool because it's like that first player that gets drafted in the in the nfl draft okay all the rest of the players start signing their contracts after that top guy because they want to be able to like come in right below them you know so you could sort of that person sets the bar so hopefully i can do whatever i can you know with this and start pushing the envelope for all of us in the kayak fishing space you know that these elite level trails like your kbfs and hobies and bass masters and then this this intermediate fun stuff here that we're kind of doing and with the kayak adventure series hopefully it just kind of pushes it the, the envelope for all of us and gets more non-endemics paying attention to us and, and the endemics as well that, that still don't really pay you know quite as much attention so hopefully i can do a lot of good with you know with that title and uh and try to repeat next year we'll see that'll be interesting it's in texas next year right yep it's in texas um i think that's about the main stuff i had to so jake <laughs> uh 
That's what I'm saying. You know, he almost should have gone first just to – so you had a great event? I it mean, was all right. 26? I mean, yeah. Like you know, I, I had a really good day one, obviously, um, you know, almost 86 inches. But that lake was just – it kind of folded to – what I would consider the pressure. And like, I think really what happened is, is like on day one, these fish were set up, you know, in those little spawning pockets before they pushed back. And then on day two, a lot of those fish were either caught or they moved back. So it was a, it was a challenging practice. Like, I don't know if people aren't familiar with tank killer outside the river, the water is super clear. Um, there are some sections that do mud up a little bit, but for the most part down, like, you know, I would say like two thirds of the lake down, it's super clear and it makes it a tough fishery and i had an awful practice like i was catching small limits at best some days we were only catching one in different spots um and i just really couldn't figure it out and then on the last day of practice i was able to find like a little cove where i'm like okay there's enough docks here there's enough a b and c spots that you could go in there and you could probably get a pretty good limit because i had caught some some good fish in these coves um, doing something that Drew and I actually kind of did on Possum Kingdom. And I felt like this lake really set up similar to Possum Kingdom. And what I mean by that is just it's one of those big, like, kind of deserty lakes. There's a lot of rock. It's clear. Yeah. It's you not know. like flooded bushes or anything or standing timber. Right. Or and grass. Like, it's, there, there's a lot of residential areas on the lake because there's like pleasure boaters and, you know, just people that fish it. And I mean, it was getting pounded with boats all weekend because um, the weather was super nice. So like all weekend was bass boats. And I, I wanted to find somewhere in my mind that was going to be different because everybody was going to be beating the banks or sitting offshore on drop offs and stuff like that. So I caught some fish in practice behind docks with a jerk bait and in my mind, I was like, okay, I can do this for eight hours and get a limit. And I'll show a clip of kind of what I was doing here. Let me see if I can present it. But um, yeah. it was it was not as easy as a lot of people would think because you had to lay your rods flat. Now, I've got my rods up high here, but um, on a lot of these... Um, a lot of these clips, like I've got my rods just laying in front of me and I'm like going under the cable. So this is early on in day one. You can see like I'm just fishing this area and this spot right here was killer. There was so many big fish in there. And I'm throwing a really tiny Okashira sc screw head. It's called, it's got a little propeller on the front with a three inch spark shad swim bait. And the reason why I'm doing finesse and why I'm so far back is like I said, the water's super clear, but the bait in the main lake was tiny. I'm talking like, that's the size they were eating. And there were just mm -hmm. thousands of them everywhere, millions even. And so I downsized after not really getting a lot of bites on the jerk bait. And you can see, like, I'm just fishing over these cables. So you've got to have good line because those cables are, like, probably. And <laughs> I couldn't get him over. So I'm like, you know what? I'm just going to net him under it, pull him Smart. up, unhook it, and then pull my bait back over because... I thought I was going to lose that. Now, this is a bad angle, but this fish was 18 inches. So it was actually one of the better fish I caught this day as I lube yeah, up my reel there tell. with some lake lube. Um, <laughs> but this was really the, the, I, the nut in a nutshell, what I was doing all day on day one is just going behind these docks, picking off fish that in my mind, no one else was targeting. Like I fished this cove mm -hmm. for 16 hours and I was the only one behind these docks. Now, this bite died off a lot on day two, obviously. I, I already kind of alluded to that. But, like, it, it's just, like, these tournaments, you've got to kind of you got to kind of come up with something that nobody else is doing because it's just mm -hmm. when there's designated launches and there's 20 people at the, at the boat ramp, you've got to – and you can see I'm using my net as a paddle <laughs> to get closer. Because <laughs> one thing you get – one change you guys might notice is I'm running an XI3 for spot lock, and that's a new addition to the arsenal on the Sholey. Because um, I picked this up because I had a feeling that <laughs> you see, I'm pulling myself closer. Yeah. I, I had a feeling it was going to be windy, and I was right. And it kind of helped me keep myself in position a little better on these docks because I would just post up alongside and pop nice. out a spot lock and just fish behind these docks. But um nice man. yeah i mean it's that awesome. was my my strategy in a nutshell is just go where no one else was i couldn't really get like right up against these because like i said the water was so clear 
that if you pushed in too far, you, you could yeah. see the fish spook. Like if you stood up and looked down, they would see you and they would they would move. So I was having to make really long casts behind these docks, cranking it super slow and big column, just super slow, and they would just pound it. Um, I think um, the biggest fish I caught this day was like almost 19. Let's see, I think I have a clip of one that's, it just gives you an idea of what these fish were doing. It's cool to see the lake, man. Thing. Never seen it. I mean, look at that. That <laughs> fish is only 17 and a half, and it's Fat. just stuffed full of bait. Like, it's just feasting on the bait. It, it was crazy. And, like, I, it, it kind of pains me that this strategy didn't, like, stay efficient on day two. But mm -hmm. I learned some pretty important lessons as an angler is that you're not only fishing against the fish. You're fishing against the boats, the weather the other kayakers and i think that cove just kind of like it just got pounded too hard i mean there was like at least 10 people in my cove on day two uh, when i got to my spot on day two there was the kayaker who had seen me catch fish there just waiting and i was like oh well <laughs> guess that's not my spot anymore but you know it really it really pays to have like backup plans to have like the a b mm -hmm. c d spot um especially on a lake like this because it was packed like i, I mean i I know I've said that like a million times, but space was at a premium. Like pretty much yeah. every drop off had a kayaker sitting on it. So, and that's a cool, good like segue to what's cool about the kayak adventure series. Really, is the fact that we can utilize all you know. People could have been put in further up at the bridge upstream on the river, and then the next bridge up from that, and the next bridge up from that. Really, utilize the entire resource. And then, what's crazy is you wouldn't have as many people on the lake when that is in place. See what I'm saying? It actually would alleviate the pressure to let the lake anglers not chop up all their fish quite so much. And it kind of spreads it all out a little bit. So it'll be cool to see, you know, um, how, how that works out. A lot of these events, people getting out and exploring some wild stuff, but how much it opens up the lakes. I'm telling you right now, the lakes are going to be big time in play at these events. Uh, I know a lot of people are excited to fish a lot of rivers and creeks at the kayak adventure series because it's, you know, definitely a rule set and a format that lets you do that kind of stuff uh, a little easier. But the lakes are just going to be wide open and live scope. I mean, if and all you're that. good with electronics, you'll yeah. do good and you do well in these because, you know, you'll have a chance to shout out Hellabass. do what you're strong at. Like, I think that's the beauty behind it, because I want to I do want to say one thing, though. Like I was yeah. fishing next to Lance, who is on the eco team with me. Um, we both launched there and Lance was not using live scope. He does not have it on his kayak. He's got just normal electronics. And he was fishing in an area that he definitely would have benefited from live scope. But what I'm really getting at is like you can do well without electronics. Like I think that that is a hot button issue right now. And obviously live scope is an advantage. But I think I think there's always room if you just buckle down and just fish with your strong at. You can do well. Mm -hmm. Like yeah and this was definitely a live scope for lake don't get me wrong like i had mine running it didn't really play a huge role in it um a little bit on day two when i had to like really start to to grind mm -hmm. a little bit but um, yeah i'll show you what live scope did actually look at this this is now the would number it really one thing be i caught on a live scope. fishing trip <laughs> yeah there you go. Catch a monster look at that crappie freaking monster black crappies <laughs> that end. look like bass <laughs> on the live scope thought it was a good yeah it takes a, it nope. does take a crappie. some time there's to my learn that you yeah, can see it's just like a little swim bait with mm -hmm. and i was using 12 pound line i normally wouldn't because like those things are really hard to cast on heavier line but i was very leery of those dot cables so i went super super long fluorocarbon 12 pound leader on my spinning rod and the reason and this is a tip for you guys if you're ever fishing like that kind of stuff around docks mm -hmm. you want a long leader because you do not want that braid to touch those docks it will break it'll saw it right off Whereas the fluorocarbon, you get a little bit more leeway. It won't break mm -hmm. as easy. So yeah, yeah, that was sure. the logic behind that. And this was like in 30 feet of water. And you know, what's funny is, is like day two, I caught a lot of smallmouth. I probably caught 30 smallmouth in like 30 feet of water. And I was just like wearing myself out. The problem was, is I couldn't find that fish over 15 inches. It was just a school of like dinks basically. And in yeah. my mind, I was like, okay, there's gotta be a big one in here somewhere, but Mm -hmm. alas there was there was there was yeah. not there was those crappie they were hanging out 
No, you got a good event, man. You know, can't complain. Just a, a bite away, for, like you said, from being on the classic stage. That's pretty cool. Um, last thing I can think of, and if we want to answer some questions, we can, to mention is just the fact that, man, it sounds – when you recap this and you show these pictures and videos, it looks easy, sounds easy. Maybe it doesn't. Maybe I'm – um, misreading the room here, but uh, I think some people think, oh, you just get up to where the unpressured fish are and magically, you know, but it's how Keith Poche fishes basically. He doesn't always, you know, smash them just because you get up to where some other fish are. But the thing is, you know, the other, other there was a lot of pressure on that river from locals, jet boats and drift boats. And it's just because you can get to those fish doesn't really mean, you know, magically they're going to bite. I mean, they get pressure up there too. It wasn't like, Oh, well, you just get up there. It was hard. And, and proof of that, I mean, no, I'm not, you know, singling uh, Steve Baker out. He was on the right pattern. He had the right thing. He had the right setup exactly like I did. He got up as far as I could, just ran out of battery power. And he unfortunately was behind me. And I, you know, I tend to be a little bit of a vacuum cleaner when I'm fishing some areas and uh, especially those sloughs and places. So he had a challenging time fishing uh, behind me. But you know, he got up there, unfortunately didn't, didn't catch him too well. All the people pre-fishing, they all fished that river. We see, saw so many people, Jake, you know, drive down and fish that river. They didn't 20, catch him, didn't figure out. And they were in, and just so you know, they were in the section um, that, you know, on day number one, John Dalton, Creek Fishing Adventures, who stayed with us, was sleeping on the couch. And it was 5.58, and I was heading out the door to go. You know, I had a five-minute drive down to our ramp. And I said, I woke John up and I said, hey, man, you know, he was snoring still. I said, hey, uh, you know, might want to get up. And and he was like, oh, no, I got my alarm set for six o'clock. OK, cool. So I, I woke him up. It cost him two minutes of sleep. I felt bad. And uh, and he didn't care. But anyway, um, the next day he's snoring there on the couch again. He had like 50 something inches, I think, on day one. I don't know if he got a limit or what. Or Isn't that right? He had like 50 or 60. I don't know. But he wasn't uh, like he in the in, fish on day one. He wasn't in the hunt. Right. So. Day two, he's just snoring there. And I said, you know what? He's got his alarm set. I'm not going to bug him. He had it set like he did, I'm sure, like like yesterday. And then he he sleeps in until about 7, 7.30, I think. He finally got on the water. He just drove right down to the ramp where I put in the most northernmost launch behind me. And I'd put in there whatever it was an hour or so before and went way up. And he fished right there and still within sight of Horseshoe Bend public access area. So like a half mile up from the ramp, but within sight of that public access area. Um, that dirt trail that drove my Tacoma down to, to launch on pre-fishing. He was within sight of that and caught 93 and three quarter inches, second biggest bag of the entire tournament. Only yeah, 95 inches. Like right in that first slough, right where the muddy, muddy water first starts to, to start from the launch. It's, it's and on the main crazy. river. He had stuff on the main river too, some big ones. Right. that They just, the water temperature had warmed. Like I said, pre-fishing, it was cold there. That was It was post-run. It was tough. And, and the guys who fished it in those days kind of, I think, got a bad read of what that river could hold. And, and I mean, it kind of worked out, obviously, in my favor. Not that it would have changed a whole lot for me because I was going up above all that pressure stuff anyway. But they were there. Even in that section right there, they were there. You could have caught them and, and potentially won the tournament. And uh, I think Steve got a little unlucky with, with his day one, but he was on the right pattern along with me. And, and he found him in pre-fishing and – that's just how fishing goes. So just because people are like, oh, Drew just gets every once in a while, just finds a little place that somebody else can't get to or whatever. And which obviously anybody else could have got there and could have set up and could have done everything I did, but it still is not easy. It is hard to do guys. And I just want to make sure that's, that's clear too. It's, it, it was just literally those two, couple of big bites that I got further upstream is all I got. I didn't get a ton of fish that 21 and a quarter made a huge difference. That 19 and a half on day one on that Gobius, you know, it definitely was the difference, but I didn't like smash numbers of fish up that river. That's for sure. So, and they were anyway. definitely in there on the river, um, on day, like during practice. Cause like I went in there and I caught, you know, the 18 inch spot I caught and it was right there by horseshoe bend, like right there at the launch. And I caught like, you know, a couple decent large mouth. And that was like, I was fishing by myself and I was like, okay, I could put this pattern together. But what scared me away from the river was wasn't really like drew and i, like, I knew steve was going to go up there because he he told me because mm -hmm. like we had talked about it and what scared me off the river was i was more worried about other people coming in there and there being like 15 kayaks because yeah. in my mind if i approached the river i was going to have to fish a lot lower because i can't go up this far right so i don't know i mean I think a lot of people think you're just going to, you know, you like Drew said, you just go in there and you just find the fish and you catch them. But um, 
I didn't tell a lot of people how many I caught on the river. You know, I just was like, yeah, you know, this is whatever. But everyone I talked to was like, oh, I didn't catch any. And I'm like, well, they're definitely in there if you fish it right. Like, it's all about yeah. angles and that stuff. Like, it's all about, like, understanding how they're going to be facing the current. Um, you know, there's some logic on whether or not it's better to fish upstream versus downstream. I prefer to fish upstream, personally. That's my preference. Obviously, if you're doing a flow, you can't do that. But, like, you know, there's... right. There's a lot of like factors that go into it and experience. You can't just go in there. I mean, like Steve's a great example. Steve's a great river fisherman and it's just, you know, he just got kind of unlucky. So mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, he did. He really is, man. He's going to win one of these things. soon. maybe Shirley Palooza. We'll see. I know he's, he's Jones for that one next. Um, but Trey did say, uh, said, yeah, I got way past the bear in Fort Creek. Like I said earlier, I, I got as far as I mean, not in a tournament day, but I went as far as 13 miles up to, check it i knew i could get up that far if i needed to it didn't have to go that far but uh he, he, oh sorry i'm sorry whoever put up that comment oh i just put up he asked about the anchor but, but he said he's caught a 22 and a quarter 6.8 pound smallmouth in there so um <laughs> they're obviously there what was the other uh comment someone so asked if you use an anchor on the river and a quarter, that's unreal anchor what was the question i don't i don't personally but I don't think Drew uh, does either. Not when I'm moving upstream with the torpedo. Not when I'm fishing that way. I do not. If I use a drag chain on floats downstream for sure. Um, Brian Slayton, they know the, the uh, creek crawler. Awesome dude. Stay with us. You guys should go follow his channel on YouTube. Uh, go subscribe. Yeah. He uh, caught his uh, PB smallmouth. Uh, him and John Dalton, I kind of sent them to some of the good good areas on the day after the tournament to see if they could get into some nice ones. And he caught a 20 and three quarters. So you can go check out that fish catch on his channel. Um, Dude, he caught it on a big swim bait too, man. It was awesome. Yeah, he's out. Yeah, that's right. He was throwing that big that swim that bait. Trade. Yeah, that's, that's right. Yeah, he was. John uh, Creek Fishing Adventures caught a nice like nineteen something as well up there. So they got it all on video on their channels. I'm not sure if they're edited yet, but look for them soon. Follow along. You'll see those guys at Kayak Adventure Series events too. If you want to uh, see them in person, uh, if you're fans of what they do. But anyway, I don't know if there's any other um, main questions to cover. So someone asked about like positioning current and, I, and I'm sure Drew has his own thoughts on this, but I personally, like if I'm trying to stay in current, I can usually put my new port on like, I don't know, 10% depending on what, um, how, how swift the current is. And you can, you can kind of just stay in position, um, especially if you're trying to pick apart an area. Now, obviously that only works if you're facing the current, but yeah, yeah. That's what you do. You just kind of use your feet, put it at the right speed. Exactly. And you can kind of hold, you can hold right there. Um, and you can do that on lakes too. Um, especially yeah. if there's like some wind, if you face the wind and put it on like 7%, you can usually stay in position pretty well. Mm -hmm. So Merlin was right, man. You guys, oh, sorry. <laughs> We're putting comment after, hang on. Uh, sorry. Uh, just Merlin, sorry, real quick. I want to say, you know, he, him and his friends joked that Drew was going to go up to the last launch up the river and yeah. run it before it started. And bam, that's, that's what happened. And, and it doesn't always work out like that, you know, when you have a plan or a vision as soon as they announce the lake, but it, it certainly did this time. And that's fishing. I mean, I lose one of those big fish and then, you know, I'm, you know, barely on the stage or whatever. So you can, a good spot will always, the winning spot, you know what a winning spot really is? It's wh it's when you can survive some of those punches, those blows where you lose a few big fish and you can still win, you know, you just, just takes a quarter inch to win or even, Right. A tie. You can still win by tiebreaker, even less than that. So that's all you need. A winning spot, you can survive blows. That's what a winning spot really is. Because there's, it's hard to fish completely clean. You know what I mean? For two days. In I a mean, row. I lost like a twenty-inch smallmouth on day one, so, which would have pushed me up into like close to ninety, because it would have been like a four and a half inch upgrade. So, yeah. I mean, if you if you can't just say, oh, that's fishing, then. You mm -hmm. know. Yep. The uh, other comments you guys are putting up there. Sorry, I put them, took them down right when y'all put them up. Someone had asked about your um, spinning, your your rod that you use on your spinning rod, mm -hmm. like the action, power action, something like that. I still throw like a medium heavy on the spinning rods. Um, you know, that Gobius was a half ounce, so I wanted something a little bit with some strength. But and it's not like it's a super, super light wire. You know what I mean? It's it's. I'd say I just love it's medium. Yeah. So I don't need, you don't need a, you know, you don't want to, you don't have to use like a medium action rod or something light, you know, super light, but I just more just, you know, wanted to get a good hook set in them and then 
just kind of play him, let, loosen up the drag and just let him just run in the open water. And then whenever, like I said, I put my hand on that reel and stop him and pull, you know, lift up and pull him out of whatever I don't want him to go in, you know, and, and wind instead of just cranking it back down when they're about to go in that log and then loosen it back up and then cranking it back down. I just, that's why I hold my hand on the reel and, and just let it not give. So might look a little funny, but. And then I mean, another those one? gobias too, they're kind of just like a tube, you know, it's like a tube hook basically. He's asking what cameras uh, I use. Uh, There's one question. I mean, I guess you're talking about the GoPro. I'm using the GoPro Hero 11. I'm about to get some 12s. Thank you, GoPro, for uh, sponsoring the Kayak Adventure Series. And you guys are going to win some some GoPros, hopefully, uh, many of you at some of the events. So, And I use the same thing, obviously. Drew yeah. and I have, like, <laughs> the same cameras. So Yeah. Uh, oh, well, the KAS come to Ontario. I mean, I would love to go to Canada at some point. You got to keep in mind, we're only going to pretty much do like six events a year, you know, it, maybe in, in one more, but there's, it's just never getting bigger than that. When you put on events that you want to be these big giant festivals, if you have a ton of events, then everyone's like, oh, I'll get the next one. Yeah, there's another one just down the road, you know, but when you have less, it, I think it just, it's a lot of work. It's the same amount of work to put on all these events. So, you know, the, the more you do, it's just more work for us and it's like splits up. You know, so I just want to be the biggest parties. Plus, I don't want, want it to detract too much from the local trails and, and other national stuff. We want to just keep it small and tight. That way people can fish one or two of these or three, whatever they want to do. But it's a low number for the AOI, you know, just fishing two of the five regular season right. events and then the, the finale at the broodstock. So, yeah, de definitely want to come to somewhere uh, in like Canada. That'd be really cool at some point because the fishing is unreal up there I mean, it really is it's a perfect kayak adventure series location so we'll have to see if we could do something like that even if we started one one year you know i don't know where maybe it's not the full-on you know somebody there like i maybe you uh you know river river smallies there can could be the guy that hosted or something and just see if we can't do like a test run and see if some enough people show up but um definitely epic fishing up there and uh yeah let's see i don't any other questions uh that's probably about it i mean yeah i don't see any that we missed well there's the designated launches question i mean i you, you know you, steve owens will be on our show next week if you want to ask him that question but uh you know designated launches i guess you know i've never heard of anyone in the kayak fishing world uh that that ever launched somewhere that was not public access but i'm sure someone did uh i don't know if they did it intentionally or unintentionally by accident but at least that helps see which ones are the official launches to go to i mean i mean no one's checking you in you know what i mean so who's to know if people aren't launching who knows where but that's why i have polygraphs and all that stuff afterwards that we you know potentially would have to pass and um that's why obviously there's gps coordinates for the tourney x you know we see where the fish are caught at least but you, you know, it's a good question to ask. Maybe I personally don't have don't a huge have that problem with them. But the yeah, problem I mean, is, is that I wish there were more. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because there was a few launches. There was like some, and this is a no fault of, of anyone at Bass, but the ramp I launched at actually had a north and south ramp at the same campground. However, only the south one was pinned. So I was very nervous about launching at the other one because... You know, it just wasn't the one they pinned, even though it theoretically was the same ramp. It's just like that one was a lot more friendly towards kayaks. And I'm like, well, you know, I don't, I don't, this is some gray area here. I just, I'll just launch the other one and go all the way around, mm -hmm. which was like 15 minutes of, of doing right. stuff. But yeah. So, well, they do, yeah, I mean, they do a good job and, uh, you know, they're growing the sport like crazy. It's, I'm excited to see where, it, where it gets and, in my career this tournament stuff's all you know long gone and it, we're going to be rolling over one day i'm sure in our graves when people are winning three hundred thousand dollars at kayak fishing tournaments oh man it'll happen one day for sure but um thanks for all the support everybody thanks for all the comments uh you guys have been great and uh i'll be on more podcasts uh to come so we'll hash out some more and eventually i'll get yeah, some all right we'll wrap this up thank you so much to both of you for sharing that story um i have a feeling this episode recorded and posted online is going to get a lot of views 
people are going to yeah. go back if you want to watch this one. So, uh, and thanks for sharing all the video. And sign up for Shirley Palooza. Go sign, sign up. up. Sign up. Go sign, sign up. up. Coming 20, 26 days, something like that. Yeah, 30. All right. See you guys. See you guys.